I'm Jan Bowen, and today I'm talking with Joanne Punch. And Joanne is many things, but today I'm going to introduce her as the owner of a business called Marketing Dish. She also has a business you may be aware of that is LinkedIn uh, for business. And she has some other things going on that we'll talk about. She's quite a marketing strategist and takes all the connections that we can, mm -hmm. she teaches us how to take all the connections that are part of marketing in a very, very authentic way um, to our real lives. So I'm so excited to be talking with Joanne today and share her wisdom and knowledge with all of you. Joanne, mm -hmm. welcome. Thanks for having me, Jan. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Such a pleasure. Um, so one of the things that I'd love for you to explain is how your business, which I think of from the way that I understand it in two large pieces, marketing mm -hmm. and then what I clump together as online, oh. um, how they both differ and go together. Could you explain that? Sure. Um, let me just give you a little background because it will connect the dots also. Um, I have been in marketing and sales and had my own business since 1996. So I've been around a long time. I started my business in when I was living in Southern California, and I relocated um, to the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where I live now. And I did that 10 years ago. And if everybody can sort of remember 10 years ago it was sort of at the beginning of when marketing was changing to more digital so at that time I really made a shift in terms of uh, what I was going to do with how I would evolve my business because I knew that things were changing and so I jumped right into really learning digital strategy digital marketing which includes social media. Sometimes people separate the two, but social media is just a function of marketing. So how LinkedIn ties into this is when I relocated, didn't know anybody professionally. And I had been a very early adopter of LinkedIn and thought, you know, what better way to meet new people than to use this tool called LinkedIn? And so I did that just to get connected to the business community in the Twin Cities. And, you know, fast forward, fast forward, how things always typically involve, people would say, well, how did you do that? How did you connect with these people? How did you meet them? And so it turned into, uh, although I was doing some social media training, it really turned into much more for me because I started speaking and training and and so it just kind of grew into a business of its own even though it's just a function of marketing so yeah so it's like a, a piece of it I see you emphasizing maybe the training of LinkedIn more than other channels is that accurate um yeah it is just in terms of as I said, you know, as I was evolving my business, I really am a believer that be good at something or some one thing and try to be mediocre at everything. And quite frankly, you know, social media has gotten complicated and it's big. And I just wanted to be the best at LinkedIn. I'm pretty good at other platforms, but I am not an expert, um, and I just think it's impossible. So yeah. that was my reasoning. And when I work with people on their marketing, I teach them what I'm preaching. Be good at at least one thing. Be the master of that before you try to be the master of everything else. And you're one of the, uh, is it the top 200 in the world of LinkedIn experts? Did yes, I've been doing this for a long time, and and so yes, I am considered among the top 100 trainers worldwide. 
that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I think it's longevity. I've stuck with it. Um, I've made a name for myself. I've worked hard at, at my craft. And so, as you know, your own business, you know, you get known over time. That is an advantage of age. We can, <laughs> we can spend the time uh, putting the time in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, it is an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you did mention moving from um, Southern California, and your website gives the explanation of how you had moved and why. Yes. And it wasn't a happy reason. It was the quite tragic reason of losing your husband and business partner, wasn't it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a very hard decision to make at the time, you know, to... He had been in Southern California for 25 years. And so it was a hard decision to make both professionally and personally. Oh, I can imagine it would be, um, especially at the stage of life when we're adults with fully formed so social circles and yeah. even those familiar routes that we have, yes. you know, all our services and things. Um, I can only imagine that would be quite tumultuous. It was. I had a, quite an interesting business there too, and I and I gave up a lot. Um, had a beautiful contract with the military. I did a lot of business with the military in those days, and it was very lucrative. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, you know, I I really gave up um, a big portion of income, but. When you're when you're grieving and when you're trying to keep your whole life together, it just doesn't seem significant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. You you took that grief though, from what I've seen, and you used it to serve others in a bigger way. You have a website and a Facebook page to help others through a grief process, don't you? I do. Yeah. At the time, um, my husband passed away. My mother, actually, I lost my mother and my husband within a month of each other. And that was in 2005. So, you know, back then, kind of got to remember the time frame. You know, I was searching for support of some kind. I wasn't even sure what kind of support, but I just knew that I wasn't really getting the support that I needed. And everything I found at that time was very clinical. And it just didn't speak to my heart. I got it up here, but I didn't get it here. So I decided to start blogging. I started that site called Heartache to Healing. And it, so what I really talk about are more heartfelt things and it also is really geared towards healing versus the clinical part of grief um i don't really i mean although i understand it um that isn't the perspective of healing that i really offer people mm -hmm. so what do you offer so I, what I really offer is hope, is um, inspiration to live your life again. I talk a lot about healing, and and I people who write to me, I often will pose the question to them, you know, what would your loved one want for you? So I really encourage and inspire people to find ways to live life again. I did. Mm -hmm. you know, at a time I thought, oh my God, I don't can't even imagine what my life's going to look like a month or two or six from now. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that's my gift to the world that I'm, I'm really good at helping people see a different perspective and that there is something else out there for them, that life isn't over. I don't care if you're, you know, 40 or 80, you know, there's still life to live. Uh -huh. And I've done some coaching with 
with people. And believe it or not, I have worked with people as young as 35. And I've worked with several widows who are in their 70s. And they're equally as lost. It's the same. It's the same thing. I mean, they're, the loss is the same, isn't it? Yeah. The world's upside down, regardless of the age. Right. Yeah. And so I think my gift is helping people see that there are, there are other things to find joy in life. And sometimes when you're grieving, you can't see anything that brings joy. So. Um, when, and we'll have all the connections and the websites and the links on the show notes. Um, which is the way that people can reach you the best with that? Is it through Facebook or on a website? Or you have a book also, don't you? An ebook? Yeah, so they could go to my website, is probably the best place to start. Okay. Um, if they go to heartache2healing.com, right on the home page of the website. Um, there's a place for them to enter their name and their email. And I just really send out hopeful information and hopeful steps on things that they can do to keep moving forward through their grief journey. That's the best place to start. And yes, I have a Facebook page as well. Okay. I would start on the website. Okay. You know, it strikes me. It's interesting because I didn't know you through the grief um, piece. I knew you through LinkedIn, and then I became aware of your marketing work. And I thought of you as being an authentic connector. It's interesting now to add this um, nuance of how you are providing hope, because to me, I also see you doing that in your business. Hmm. It's a clarity that you provide when people Mm -hmm. feel that overwhelm. Mm -hmm. Because to you, it may seem simple, but that that's the case with our work, isn't it? I mean, to us, it's like crystal clear, but to people that need help, it isn't so clear. Yes. So the service that you provide to you may seem simple, but the service you you are giving isn't so obvious to the others. Yes. So you are providing hope and clarity um, and inspiration, really, in your marketing and yes. say, and online work. Because now I understand that it's just the same. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll yeah. repair my language on that. Um, but I see it very connected. Yeah, I hadn't looked at it that way. Appreciate your perspective. It's, yeah, um, you're what, right. Just a just a thought. Mm-hmm. Were you doing something similar in any way before uh, the tragedies? Uh, well, you know, had, we had had our business for quite a few years prior to that, so I I think I've always been well. I think one of my core values is relationship and connecting. And I'm very good at that. And I'm good at building relationships with people. So I think that all ties together for me, it, both personally and professionally. I've had people are shocked that I have, you know, 40 year old or 40 year plus friends that I've had friendships for all these years, but I work at it. I'm good at building relationships with people. And so I know how to do that professionally as well. Mm-hmm. And so that's why you see me always talking about the value of relationship and that connections matter. And professionally, you know, I talk a lot about network being your net worth. And things like that. I I take that. Uh, so has served me well personally, but I it's what I teach professionally. Mm-hmm. And I think the most recent article that I saw that you wrote that I um, really enjoyed was about how um, LinkedIn specifically, I think, was referenced in this article. Instead of being a network, could had the hazard of becoming a database. Yes. And I 
really appreciated your perspective on that because it's so true. If we don't make that connection, as you say, it's just, yeah. you know, like a, a, custom, a CRM, you know, just a database exactly. of names. So mm-hmm. what I'm also aware of is those relationships, like you just said, do take time. How do you, how do you make time for those friendships and business relationships? I make time because I just make it a priority. So I, I'm not super patient with people who use time as the excuse because it, for me, it just matters. Relationships matter and, it, and because it's part of my core values, I make time. And that's, I guess, the flip side is why people don't make time. It's not one of their values. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand that, um, but at the same time, professionally, when I'm trying to teach, people come to me and they say, Joanne, you know, I need more leads. I, I, I teach them that they have to build relationships because ultimately people do business with people. Right, right, <laughs> right. And they, and they do business with people they know, like, and trust, and that requires effort in building and maintaining relationships yeah are there quote-unquote tricks that you think um work in terms of not in shortcutting the relationship that's just icky but yeah uh, when i said that i thought no 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 i'm not going down that road but in terms of time management Absolutely. I mean, uh, for you can all, we all can do a better job with time management. Let's face it, right? Um, I think you need a process. And for example, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some of my own personal processes. So every day, uh, uh, professionally, I look at my what's happening on LinkedIn. So do I have any invitations? If I do, I respond to them immediately. If I have any messages, I respond to them immediately. Then I'm, as you know, I'm really big on engaging. I have a very engaged network. So I spend five or 10 minutes and I go through the home page on LinkedIn and I look for people that I can help, that I can engage with, um, in some way, shape, or form. Now, this doesn't have to take a lot of time. I do it a couple of times a day, maybe for 10 minutes. The key is this, it's consistency. Uh-huh. So it isn't that it takes me a lot of time, but I do it every day. Uh-huh. And, and personally, you know, I have the same commitment to family and friends that I'm committed to finding the time to do something with them. Mm-hmm. So an example is every week I, I have my dad over for dinner and I make a point of it. I just fit it in my schedule. Mm-hmm. So whether it's Friday or Saturday or Sunday, it doesn't matter, but I make it a priority. So again, it kind of goes back to your commitment and your priority. I agree. Um, I always come back to the same point that you're making. Things don't really have to be that difficult if you make that commitment. And yeah. once it's a commitment, it becomes a priority because it is part of your value. So I share that perspective with you. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm curious. Who was your first friend? Do you remember? You're such a relationship person. Um, I absolutely remember. Um, I'm still friends to this day with my junior high school friends. That's about as far back as I go. <laughs> Not the kindergarten type. I'm the, but in junior high, I have the same, the same, who are my good friends? I'm still friends with today. As a matter of fact, uh, one of them, I was at their son's wedding two weeks ago. Oh. And we're good friends to this day. That is really lovely. And um, was returning to St. Paul, Minneapolis, part of the reason of so you could reconnect with people that you had known? Well, my all of my family was here. Ah. So after my husband passed, I didn't really have any family support. 
Um, and my husband's family wasn't there either. In fact, my husband's family is in Washington. Ah. So, you know, I, it just was a decision I made to back to your roots. Right, right. Which makes perfect sense. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know that I love your business name, Marketing Dish. Mm -hmm. On your website, it explains how it came about. And I encourage mm -hmm. any, everybody and anybody to read your about page because it has so much information about your business values, your mission, mm -hmm. the explanation of your history. Everything is on there. And I love how clearly it's all stated. Um, but I'd love to hear more of the backstory of how your love for people and entertaining once again um, yeah. formed your name. Yeah. Yeah. So that is interesting. I, I was going through a rebrand about five or so years ago now, maybe it was longer, but regardless, I, I was really trying to come up with a name that did tie into my values and, and it ended up, I came across that name because I really wanted to have something more fun. Mm -hmm. That was part of it. Uh, and catchy. And so I was having dinner with a really good friend of mine who's also a foodie like I am. And we were having this great meal. and We were kind of brainstorming ideas together. And all of a sudden, it was marketing, serving up solutions for your online success. And it just came like that. Um, just through conversation with a like-minded person. So that's where my inspiration came from. It's perfect. I just love that. I love how it came also with a friend. I mean, everything yeah. that you talk about in this way has a synergy with a yeah. relationship or a friend or a connection. Yeah. yeah, it does, doesn't it? So one of your passions is entertaining. Yeah. What's your... I, yeah, I love to entertain. I love to have people over. I like, I like the idea of sharing a meal with people. Um, there's a real connection in that for me. Uh, I, I love that we could actually sit down and have meaningful conversation and enjoy a good meal. I just love that. I love that whole idea. I probably should be a restaurateur. Maybe I was in a past life. I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds fun. One of the things that you've said um, in different ways at different times that has always stuck with me since you first said it that I really like is to take the connections that we make online, offline. Mm -hmm. And I think what you just said about meals is such a lovely way to do that. Even if you, it's just over a coffee or something, mm -hmm. because there's that yeah. bonding and yet it's a, it's a bonding over a neutrality. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's just a lovely um, age old practice. Yeah. I think we've kind of gotten a little lazy in with all this social media and technology and you know as much as you and I love technology and what it can do at the same time I think we have to balance that and the balance is what you just said you know um uh is actually picking up the phone and talking to someone and like you said share a cup of coffee uh, you know amazing things can happen when we take it to the next level so even when I work with people on LinkedIn, I always teach them that the goal isn't that people are going to make a decision about you by reading your profile. The goal is you're going to have a conversation. That should be your goal. Because of that, do you think the um, growth overall with business is towards more local and regional business? Um, I think it depends. Um, what, one thought is that we've become so global. So I've had the opportunity to work with people in Singapore, in Europe, 
so in some ways it's it's become bigger but in other ways I think it depends a little bit on your business and your personality and how big you think you know some people are just comfortable associating and doing business in their own community and that's fine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do I do wonder sometimes I ask that question um, it just in a question of the trending because we have the capability of being mm-hmm. so global and it is a mm-hmm. comfort level that many of us have because the technology allows it and our right. experience allows it and yet as we've been talking about the connection on a one-on-one basis to sit across the table. I mean, you and I are in different cities, but I'd love nothing more to be doing this live. Right. Right. Um, And so then I, I look to the model of being able to have a local community where everything meets my business goals in a local community. So that's a question that comes up for me sometimes. And I wonder, Mm. you know, what is ahead? Will we, will we become Mm. weary as a culture of the huge growth and Mm. narrow it down ourselves? I don't know. I don't know. You do business. No, out of state as well. So what, what is your feeling? I know that for me right now, my business model couldn't financially support itself just locally mm-hmm. um, with my goals and all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I wouldn't have the creative opportunities um, mm-hmm. unless I went outside of my area because I live in a very small area. Right. And I've not always lived and worked here. I've worked in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm used to and I love. Mm-hmm. So it's part of what I like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, you know, love mm-hmm. working with people that I can go to Pilates class with. Right. Um, so it's a mix. It's a yeah. It's, it is. Yeah. I think it's becoming for me. It's becoming comfortable with the gray instead of the black and the white. Mm, very good point. Yes, I like that. <sighs> what are some of your passions besides entertaining and um, cooking? Um, in relationships, well, I have a real passion for nature. Ah. I, l- I love to be in nature. Um, it really fills me up um, physically and spiritually. It fills me up. So I, that's, that's a big part of what I like to do when I'm not working is be in nature. I love to hike. I love to walk, I love to bike, um, those kinds of things. Um, I, I'm really passionate about seniors uh, I, in terms of listening and learning and Growing from their wisdom, um, that's a real passion for me. Um, I, I love to learn. So I find I spend probably too much time actually um, learning professional things. That's what happens when you own your own business, you know. Because I have a lot of other personal interests and I kind of shove those aside because I want to take this course or brush up on this and, you know, stacks of business books and, you know, that goes your business owner. Same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. My business books um, far outweigh my fiction books and that wasn't always. Yeah. The- yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Are you a reader? Do you like to read? I love to read. Yeah. Yes, I love to read. Yeah. So I just, um, it's just kind of finding the time. Like I said, I have so many business books going all the time that I don't as much leisure reading as I used to in years gone by. Just so many hours in the day, right? <laughs> and exactly. Are book clubs a social event in uh, your area? Is that a thing that you have as part of your group? Um, I have, I, interesting you say that. I belong to a writer's group. 
Ah. Um, but I've never really belonged to a club. Uh, it's popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just wondered. Um, because they are a way that I know when I've gone to different areas um, to form friendships and meet people. So in terms of relationships. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Because then you have a common interest and it's different mm -hmm. personalities and you're connecting at an authentic level. Mm -hmm. And with a like interest. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned a lot of things in terms of movement, hiking, biking, walking. Is that mm -hmm. how you reground and center yourself? Pretty much. Mm -hmm. It is. I... I really down to the earth um it's really important to me and so i have to admit i struggle a bit for all these months of winter where i live now that's right yeah it's actually it's kind of a challenge for me so i um anyway it just is what it is um so i i spend more time meditating and than I do, as I consider walking and hiking, you know, a meditation, a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. But I don't get out in too many winter sports, so <laughs> I'm inside meditating, where you contemplating. Are, where you are, it's extremely cold in the winter, isn't it? Uh, um, I think that's a bit of a misnomer, actually. Okay. People... People really think it's, you know, the tundra up here, but it's not the case at all. Oh. Um, so I'm just not a big hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like to travel for leisure? I love to travel. Yes, I love to travel. I'm very adventuresome. Um, I have been that way my whole life i could get on a plane and go to some foreign city and have the time of my life it's because i'm an adventurer you're an adventurer and yeah. the parts of travel that i think of uh with what you've said are the learning you're a learner yes. yeah and connections right yeah Love to meet new people, love to, I'm very open when I go somewhere to connect with the locals and, and find out what's happening. I love that. Yes. And the yeah. food. You, do you well, have... there's that. <laughs> <laughs> there's always the food. <laughs> I'm not a great cook. Well, I'm, I, I'm fine. Um, it's not something I love to do. So when, when other people say they love to, it's like, great. I, you know, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, because I'll bring the wine. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I cook because it's something that we need to do to eat well. Oh. Um, and I make sure that I do it, yeah. you know, to the utmost. But it's not something in my leisure I think, hmm, what do I want to do? Oh, let's go in the kitchen. Um, oh. <laughs> Where would you go, Jan? Oh, I'm a nature girl. Um, I go yeah. outside year round. I bundle up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the water, in the woods. Yeah. Um, and animals. Um, anything, anything that takes me outside close to nature. Yeah. yeah. And we're kindred spirits in that way, for sure. Yeah. 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 I love to pay attention to. Um, what is happening outside of myself, you know, mm. to listen and pay attention and then mm -hmm. contemplate what that mm -hmm. represents. Mm -hmm. I did uh, just to share a quick story with you. When I, when I moved from California to back here to Minneapolis and, you know, during such a time of turmoil for me and I moved here and I took a month off to do nothing. That was really hard. Was it? Sounds fun, you know, right? It sounds fun to everybody, but I needed to just kind of check out. And so I 
moved in the spring. And so I literally sat on my patio for a month. And how this relates is because I really paid attention to nature. I really, really listened to the birds, really watched the butterflies, things that we in our everyday life, we just kind of ignore as part of the background. But I made a real attempt at paying attention to that. And it was really so healthy for me in so many different ways just to pay attention to the world around me and to listen to the birds, you know. Again, that's one of those things that kind of happens in the background, right? When you're intentionally listening to a bird, it's just different. Mm-hmm. It's very different. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that there are certain birds or animals or signs that follow you specifically? I not entirely sure. I try to pay attention to those things. I think at times I've had very specific symbols, the moment that meant something. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't know on a continual basis. I mean, I have right out of my office I'm sitting in, I'm facing you, but I look out a beautiful window with woods behind me. And so try during the day to pay attention to the animals and the sounds and because I have a lot of animals around here, just little critters, you know, Mm -hmm. but they're all busy doing things and I kind of enjoy that. Mm -hmm. They've got their mission too, don't they? Yes, they do. (laughs) Yes. Is your life in that way different than it was when you were in California? Definitely. I mean, if anybody lives who's listening to this lives in California, who has lived in California, you know, we all can relate to the fact that it's crazy busy. You know, just get on a freeway there. And so big difference. It's not that there's not, I live in a big metropolitan area, but where I, where I reside in that metropolitan area is not in a busy place. So my life has changed dramatically in that way. It slowed down a lot. And that was really the key factor for my moving was that I needed to slow down. I needed to get out of that fast-paced lifestyle I had prior to that. You were in Southern California, correct? I was, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, I'm thinking of something about birds that I was just writing about this, actually, and I've said it before, so I hope I'm not repeating myself to you, but we actually share an element with birds in their song, in how we both create songs. Mm. And I love that. I love Mm. that, you know, in our world, we're all connected. Yeah. We're even connected to birds. So sometimes I believe that we feel things without knowing all of them. And then when we see some validation in some way through a research study or through, you know, something that we read, to me, it's so exciting because it's like, oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I had read that study about birds, it stuck with me. I thought, oh, maybe that's why they hit my heart so much. Mm. Didn't know that. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, what kind of music do you respond to? Uh, all kinds. I, I have a very eclectic um, library of music from, depends on my mood. Yeah. You know, I, I, love, I love a lot of old, old music. I love old rock and roll. I, it just depends on the mood. Yeah. I listen to everything. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, I just forgot what I was going to say about music. Something about, oh, with workshops. Do you wrap music into your workshops at all? You do a lot of workshops. Yeah, I do. No, I never have. Mm -mm. Just just curious. Mm -hmm. Um, 
with your um, cooking and all of that, it's very creative. With your work, it's very creative. Do you do any sort of artistic work? Um, not a lot. I, I used to um, for about 25, 30 years ago, but yeah, I, I don't very much anymore, interestingly enough. What was it that you used to do? I, I used to I used to do a lot of more crafty things, although I say that and I recently made kind of a sculpture for my home. Wow. It was the first thing I'd made in years and years and years and years. So it's probably in my future again. Yeah. Did you enjoy doing it? Yeah. Going back to it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. Because I think of the sorts of things that you do as being very creative, and I, you know, we express it in different ways. Yeah, by we do. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So, like you, you're real creative when it comes to graphics, and you have a lot of inspiring graphics that you put out on social media. I mean, I find that to be very creative. Um, I do some of that. So, uh, uh, some of that is creative for me. Um, artistic and is a little different I think it's more like your sculpture like you said yeah yeah Yeah. creative expression well you write that's creative expression yes yeah but the sculpture is more the artistic part yeah like painting or sculpting or crafts yeah that's interesting yeah um and to me I do I put it in that bucket of like when we were talking about our books you know getting Mm -hmm. to the business books versus the fiction books yep you know, whether it's a part of us that we're tapping into or not. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. This part. Yeah. Um, when you work with uh, people on grief, are there any sorts of tools that you find like creativity or intuition mm-hmm. or anything that you find specifically useful in terms of bringing forward hope? Um, I- no. Uh, yes and no. Um, I find what has to come first, quite honestly, is you have to decide. So making the decision to be happy um, is the primary, I think, the primary way people catapult themselves to wherever it is they're going to go. So I think before you can sometimes use some of those techniques, you have to decide that I'm open, I'm willing to try, I want to be happy, I want to, you know, explore. That's been my feeling. Until you decide and you stay in grief. I mean, in... And sadness. I think you can continue to live life without losing the memory of your loved one mm-hmm. <clears throat> throughout your grief journey. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but you have to decide you want to be happy. You have to decide you want to, to actively grieve and move through that process. You know, it's interesting <clears throat> um, that decision is similar in the way that I hear it to the same uh, commitment level that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It it very much is. You don't, I think you don't have to understand it to make a decision to, uh, I don't know what I have to do to feel better, but I want to feel better. So I'm making the decision to try X, Y, Z. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it's that first step. So if somebody were to say, okay, man, I'm feeling horrible and I know I want to feel better and I will do what it takes. That's the, that's the step, right? That's what I'm saying. Because some people don't want to be better. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a choice too, right? Mm-hmm. You get right. to decide. Right, right. Yeah. 
and we, yeah, I share that um, perspective that we it is in our power to to affect how we feel. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what is next for you? You're doing incredible things. What do you? What is your vision? <laughs> Well, the vision that I hold most often Mm -hmm. is that uh, I want to live more of a lap up lifestyle where I can travel more and run my business from wherever. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really my big picture goal Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of specifically what's next. I don't know. Let's see. Um, are you closer to getting to that laptop lifestyle than you were a year ago? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, although when I say that, there's still, you know, there's lots of things happening in the background and Things that always end up taking more time than you think they're going to, right? Isn't that true? Yeah. 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 I think for me, my biggest secret to time management is allow more time than I think it's going to take. And then I have a feeling of peace of mind mm-hmm. uh, because my old habit was to underestimate everything and always be stressed that it took more time. It's like, yeah. no, it takes much more time than I think it does. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So that's exciting. So from your um, mm-hmm. next steps forward, I'm going to just chunk it down into pieces. What do you have on the horizon that's exciting for you in terms of your LinkedIn business? Do you have any workshops coming up or webinars? You always have something happening in that area. <laughs> Um, I don't have any webinars coming up, believe it or not. I'm surprised. Um, I've done, uh, this fall, I've done a lot of speaking and it's been local. Most of it's been local. Um, so that's taken, you know, as you know, in the prep time, it takes a lot of time to do that. Yeah. Um, and in the background, I'm, I'm working on creating some courses that I want to put online. So, you know, that's all kind of a, Back end process that I'm working on. In terms of marketing dish, what I'm doing with that, I'm, I'm right in the process of creating an in person coaching group uh-huh. um, for small business owners who who really need help in terms of what should I do for my business and how do I do it? And I think the missing piece that I have found um, with my niche of small business owners and some entrepreneurs is they say to me, I don't know what to do. There's so many things out there and I don't know how to do it. I th- and so the reason I decided to to this coaching group together was so I could sit in a room of 10 people and hands on um, teach them the processes over the course of six months and then decide how it fits in their marketing framework and then help them get there. So I think the hands-on piece is going to be really valuable for them. And so I'm working on filling that group right now, as a matter of fact, because I'm kicking it off in November. November. Oh, super. Um, Do you know the date right now? Um, Well, I'm going to kick that off on November 3rd. November 3rd. Okay. Super. But again, uh, and then what I would do probably am I'm going to do from there is to, um, after I get about, you know, three months under my belt, I may start the same thing and offer it online. That's super. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. That, um, when you said the value to them would be the hands-on, I absolutely agree because we learn so much from really digging into the details mm-hmm. ourselves too. Yeah. Yeah. In concert <laughs> with an expert like yourself. 
And uh, couple that with the peer support because right. I think being supported by your peers does a couple of things. I think number one, it makes you play a bigger game. Yeah. It, because we've got like-minded people that are pushing you to your success also. Um, the other piece that is huge is accountability. Because, you know, you can take all the courses you want in the world, right? You can learn this, learn that. But if you don't take action and implement, it doesn't matter. So one of my superpowers is that I'm really good at holding people accountable to getting things done. And I think, you know, lots of people can identify with that. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. So there'll be a lot of structure around that piece as well. Um, Because I want people to be successful. You know, I want them to, to, you know, use tools and make changes that are moving them closer to, you know, their business objectives. Right. And one of your values for your business is empowering others, which is visibly done through that. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, and then we talked about the um, heartache to healing. Do you have other steps that you know you're changing or moving forward with that? Yeah, actually, I, I've been a, uh, it's kind of been ruminating back here for a while because people email me all the time. It's fascinating. Um, so I hear from people that are on my email list who email me questions all the time. And so I'm thinking about maybe putting together some online training in that space as well, because some, I'll tell you what, there is an interesting common denominator when it comes to grief. And that is the fact that people oftentimes feel alone in their grief. Uh, And so even an online community, so being online gives people the ability to connect with like-minded people. Mm-hmm. And, and that's important when you're grieving, that you connect with people who understand mm-hmm. what you might be experiencing. So I, I've got some things that I'm working on right now that I'm hoping to implement by the end of the year or so. I'm looking forward to that, of serving that market. I think I can, you know, I've had such a calling to serve others that I hope that I can put some meaningful work out there that will help. Oh, I have no doubt of that. Everything you do has that in it. Um, You know, it's interesting, Joanne, you are such an expert at video and online courses with all your work. I know it's just an application of your work, but you really excel at it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. And it's part of everything that you're doing. I mean, it's just like natural. You talk about it. And I'm doing an online course. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, it's not just doing an online course. That's quite an effort in itself. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, as you know, that that compose these things. But, you know, I think business has changed. And if you want to operate online, you have to learn to embrace some of these things. So, you know, I'm not always um, prepared to be online. Sometimes I have to write myself out a little script. So I I know ahead of time, okay, here's my plan, here's my objective. So I'm not blah, 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 all over the place, right? It's, it's easy to do. Oh, yeah. 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 And it's easy to just freeze and all that. But preparation uh, is part of what we should all be doing, in my opinion. I mean, even if agree we don't with you. write it out, it should at least be somewhere prepared. I agree. Um, so, what in all of this? in your work and your plans and all, would you consider your greatest challenge, your greatest challenge? Hmm. Um, I think sometimes my greatest challenge 
is around believing that I'm, I'm in fact delivering enough value to people. Enough. Is this enough? Is um, am I really moving the mark here for people? Um, I think that's really is my biggest challenge. You know, it is is what I'm providing. It isn't so much what they need. I think that for me, it's more about, you know, was I able to have them move the mark? Because they weren't able to make change from from me, then I'm not doing my job. <laughs> Whatever that is, job is, right? Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying. You do have metrics, I know, because I've seen them. You talk about them and such, right? I so, do. Yeah, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It comes from, you know, you talked about things coming from the heart, yes. even your business. You talked about the heartache to healing coming from the heart. Um, I also mm -hmm. hear that your business comes from the heart, too, because it is about relationships and connections. Yeah, it is. It is for me, and I, I'm constantly trying to connect with people who get it. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, I'm around a lot of people all the time, online and offline. And I think it's sad that it's the minority. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it's very fascinating to me. Um, you know, I'm always constantly interested in learning behavior and why we do what we do. Um, I certainly don't understand it all, but when it comes to relationships, it's just fascinating to me. And professionally, uh, and I'll just give you a really quick story. I did a, well, and I wrote about it in the article you just read. Just briefly to tell the audience, I did my own kind of behavioral study in August, and I, I reached out to 50 people in my LinkedIn network who invited me to connect initially. And I just wanted to know from them, I wanted to reach out and add some value. So I said, as a connection, I want to learn more about you. So tell me what you're really good at. And is there anyone I could introduce you to? And out of 50 people, I only got eight responses. That was astounding in itself. And out of those eight, only four answered my questions. And so I find that to be really fascinating that 42 people did not even respond to me at all. And yet they were the ones who invited me to connect initially. So what does that tell us about the behavior of people building relationships online and professionally? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's fascinating to me. It is. There's a lot of questions there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, there's so much more to talk about there. Yeah. <laughs> no, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. And that's fascinating in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Was psychology something that interested you as a young girl? Um, I don't know if it, if it technically did. It probably did more subliminally, right? Yeah, but not that you were aware of. You. No. Yeah. Um, who influenced you in terms of authors or composers or artists? Who Who do you think of when you think of, oh, I love how they say that, or I love how they convey that or write that? Or... Um, so I, I would say in, in talking specifically, or to answer your question specifically, um, Maya Angelou was a big influence on me. I, I loved what, what she had to say about most things in life because they were so practical. Um, artistically, believe it or not, I was a giant fan of Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. As I may, and maybe that was because I wanted to know what the heck was going on up here <laughs> that you would create this stuff. So that was a big influence on me. Um, let me think. Well, I'm so at me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. As we close, is there anything that you'd like to add that I haven't asked? 
Gosh, not a thing, Jan. You asked a lot of fabulous questions. Loved this conversation with you. Oh, I could talk to you forever. Seriously. Oh, yeah. gosh. It, I just I love your questions because they're so meaningful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I share yeah. your love for conversations. Yeah. I wish it was over a table with coffee or tea. It will be. Maybe a pastry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but until then, I will share all of your wonderful, wonderful um, wisdom and insight. And along the way, you shared some very helpful advice and gems about marketing mm. and uh, social media that I will also mm. extract um, mm. and share with our audience. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, I try to write useful information on my blog. Uh So I encourage people to visit my blogs, whether it's my marketing dish or whether it's, you know, my LinkedIn for Business blog, because I I really try to help people do things. You do. You're very actionable. You give um, uh, uh, tips on the best... um, apps and software and programs and all kinds Mm -hmm. of things so i will have all those in the show notes but if you could Mm -hmm. just tell people the ways to get a hold of you that would be helpful too (laughs) there's probably too many but because i have so many websites but you can reach me at joanne j-o-a-n-n-e marketingdish.com or Joanne at LinkedInForBusiness.com. Uh, those are my two business sites. And, and then you'll have a link to the heartache to healing.com site. So perfect. Any of those, reach out to me. And you can find me on all the social media sites. I'm I think I'm the only Joanne Funch, so I'm easy to find. I didn't find any other Joanne Funches on social media, so easy to find that's a gift in itself yeah oh yeah yeah for sure (laughs) wonderful well thank you so much thank you jan a fun conversation i really appreciate you you too